you guys have fun? You guys sound tired. You've had fun, but you're tired. That's how you know you had fun. You sound like an American college student. I'm so tired, but I'm having fun, but I want to have more fun, but I'm so tired. All right, well, I'll tell you what. The only thing standing between you and freedom is me. (laughs) It's a bold statement. It is a bold statement. I'm a bold kind of guy, right? So uh, we will now begin part one of my eight-hour keynote. I tried to make a keynote that would be as long as Avengers Infinity War, but I came up short. So, you guys know who they are? Nope. Let the heckling begin. I can see already this crowd is punchy. This is actually a development team, uh, I believe, that was associated with NVIDIA. Uh, In particular, this is development team that uh, was based out of India. And this is becoming more and more common across a variety of companies, particularly poignant to us in the United States because we have a fair amount of concern over uh, all this development work going outside of the US, but it's also of concern to anybody because quite frankly, outsourcing can occur regardless of where the home company is based. See, when I was a kid, the pathway to success, the pathway to being a successful adult, right? You you, you get married, you have two and a half kids, you have your own house, you've got the nice car in the garage, et cetera, et cetera. The path was very, very simple. It was very established. You went to school, you got good grades, You finished high school, you went to a nice university, you got good grades, you graduated, you worked for a number of years in your chosen field, and after doing so, you'd be able to get married, buy the house, get the kids, et cetera, et cetera. And um, this was so deeply ingrained in us, as a matter of fact, that in the U.S., and this is true across most educational systems, in the U.S., we created a series of tests to verify how good you are going to be at a particular topic or chosen profession. For example, the Scholastic Aptitude Test, the SAT test, was designed to test to see how well you would do in university. And because this was such a big deal, we actually developed a test to come before the SAT called the pre-SAT or the PSAT, which was literally a test to test how well you knew the test. But it doesn't stop there because if you want to go to law school, if you want to go to medical school, if you want to go to a variety of different schools, then there are tests there. As a matter of fact, we even invented a test called the Wonderlick which is designed to be a test of general education, which the National Football League actually gives to incoming athletes to determine how smart they are for playing football. Never thought that I would ever say that you had to take a test in order to play football. But there it is. As a matter of fact, we even have tests that are given to you when you're about 13 or 14 years old, designed to help you identify what your strengths are so that they can identify what jobs you should take. As a matter of fact, when I took this test, what it told me is that I should go become a priest. (laughs) And I did, sort of. I am an officially ordained minister of the Church of the Latter-day Dude, Dudism.com, it's a thing, world's slowest growing religion. (laughs) But it's a real thing. But the formula is different now. The path to financial independence is not quite that simple. A lot of it has to do with what people are calling the gig economy. The idea that you just pick up and do work based on your time. But a lot of that was based on the fact that there was a lot of outsourcing that was going on during the 2000 and the 2010s. And it continues to this day, right? India and China are churning out 
literally hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of engineering graduates, and that does not count all of the graduates that are coming from excellent schools all over the world, Eastern Europe, Western Europe, etc. And in many cases, at least historically, because of differences in the local economy, many cases we can hire those developers for much, much less than what we would have to pay for them in the U.S. This makes a lot of U.S. developers very nervous. But the fact of the matter is, it's always going to be the case that there will be some place in the world that is cheaper than where you live. Poland used to be one of the great places where people wanted to outsource to, and now actually I'm hearing that people are outsourcing jobs out of Poland into other parts of the world, like South America. And of course, India is the poster child for this, because it seems like there's always a company that's willing to you know, take the project from you and outsource it to India so that they can fail more cheaply. You guys know who this is? He's an American icon. His name is John Henry. If you ever want to hear some really good traditional American folk music, Google John Henry. And in particular, there was a song written about him by Johnny Cash. And if Johnny Cash writes a song about you, Johnny Cash, by the way, is like one of the greatest American country music heroes ever, the man in black. Folsom State Prison, blah, 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 blah. If Johnny Cash does a song about you, then you're pretty much a big deal. For those of you who don't know the legend of John Henry, back during America's expansionist phase, when we were growing from the East Coast to the West Coast, there was a tremendous amount of expansion happening in terms of building railroads. And John Henry, in particular, was a steel-driving man. He was one of those who wielded these big hammers, in many cases either to break rocks up in order to smooth the ground so we could lay the tracks, or in some cases swinging to actually nail the railroad ties and the railroads into the ties and so on and so forth. This was a man who was born with a hammer in his hand. And the legend goes that one day, this fancy Easterner, this guy from New York, you can imagine him, he was probably working as a salesperson at your local IDE company, came by with this machine, this steam-powered drill that he claimed would do the work of 10 men. And John Henry said, that's, that's, that, that's full of crap. There's no possible way. I challenge the steam drill to a race. And it's a marvelous, marvelous story, right? In the beginning, the steam drill gets out ahead. John Henry struggles to catch up. They're neck and neck as they come into the end. And with a last superhuman effort, John Henry gives it his all, manages to beat the steam drill by the smallest slender of a margin, and dies. Do you know who this is? This guy's figured it'll be right around the corner from you guys. This is Gary, uh, Jerry Kasparov, one of the greatest chess players known to mankind. Won his first world championship in 1985. I know some of you hadn't even been born yet. So he's been playing chess for a really, really long time, and it turns out he's really, really good at it. And then one day, he decided to take up the fateful challenge against a machine. Some city slicker from New York, from IBM, of course, came by and said, hey, I want to challenge you to a match. We want to put you up against Deep Blue. We want you to play a traditional chess match, best out of five games. And Kasparov played the first match, played the second match. By the third match, he was barely able to eke out a tie and was so, so, so distraught over how well the computer was playing against him that he really wasn't in it for the last two matches. He formally lost to Deep Blue in 1997. But at least he didn't die. He's still around, yay. The two stories have in common one thing. Man versus machine. Automation. As we look around, Automation, that is allowing software, allowing computers to do more and more and more of our work, is continuing to grow. Used to be a time, ladies and gents, 
when you would sit down in front of the machine and you would carefully plan out each assembly level instruction that you were going to execute. And you carefully crafted how each byte of memory would be used. There are people who managed to eke out some actually good video games on an 8-bit machine where the instructions were timed to run in between the time it took to draw the screen and then start over to draw the screen again. This was a time when people counted clock cycles and how many CPU cycles would it take for me to actually carry out this particular instruction versus the next instruction. Today, we just write some code inside of an IDE that's actually a browser that's running on top of an operating system that has, what, 16 gigabytes of memory, 10 of which are occupied by Chrome at any given point in time, right? Yeah, so what if it takes another extra gigabyte of memory? Cloud space is cheap. We'll just buy more, right? I'm convinced that Apple actually refuses to go beyond 16 gigabytes on their laptops because they have decided that that is just enough for everybody. You don't need any more. We have tools, compilers, virtual machines. We have tools that will actually write code for you. We have tools that will write tests for you. We have tools that will run your tests for you. We have tools that will do just about anything. How much longer do you think it's going to be before it actually starts doing what you do on a regular basis? How much longer before we actually have tools that elevate the layer of abstraction so much that managers can write code? That's, in many respects, always been the goal. Go look at any 4GL that came out, especially during the 90s and the 2000s. The goal has always been to let non-developers be able to write code. Automation allows the unskilled to be able to do the work of the skilled. That's the whole point. I don't need to know how to sling a hammer if I can sit on a machine and drive a steering wheel. I don't need to know how to plant crops if I can drive a tractor and have a thing behind me drop seeds into the ground. I don't need to know how to write code if I can drag and drop various elements onto a screen. I don't need the skill if automation can take that away from me. And by the way, this is not limited just to the field of technology and software that we're talking about here. There's been drives to automate a whole number of things. Back in the day, you used to have a family lawyer. You would have somebody at a law firm, usually a partner who had struck out and started their own business. And if you needed to draw up a will, if you wanted to set up a trust, if you wanted to even figure out if you needed to create a prenuptial agreement between you and your third wife, you would go and consult your family lawyer. You'd make time at their offices. They would sit down with you. They would talk about your particular situation, the whole nine yards. Today, we have LegalZoom.com. Or if you're a doctor, you, were, you had a family doctor. If you were feeling ill, you, you went and talked to the family doctor, and they knew you. They knew your particular conditions. They knew what you were prone to. They knew what they had discussed with you in the past. Today, we have WebMD. Which, by the way, if you go up on WebMD and plug in your symptoms, you have cancer. I don't care what the symptoms are, you have cancer. Because everything leads to cancer eventually. As a matter of fact, there are efforts to try to help smooth the diagnosis process. As a matter of fact, there was a, um, at a medical show a number of years ago, they demonstrated this amazing device where they could take an x-ray from a patient. They could put it on a flatbed, kind of like a scanner, push a button, and churn, 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 churn. Lights would flicker. Things would think for a little bit. This was before cloud made all of that unnecessary. And a little while later, about five, ten minutes later, a diagnosis would print out. And everybody in the audience was like, oh, my God, this is amazing. This is incredible. This is, you know, medical automation at its finest. And for some reason, everybody was really pissed off when they discovered that what was happening is we were actually faxing this to a doctor in India. <laughs> I mean, at the end of the day, who cares what the implementation details are, right? It's all well encapsulated behind this device. Automation is coming for all of us in one form or another. 
And it's a reasonable question because at this point, you're probably thinking, dude, this is a terrible keynote. We've come to this conference and we've learned all these new things and you're now telling us it doesn't matter. We're all going to be fired somewhere in the next five years. So, so, so come on, there's got to be a note here, right? There's got to be something that says this is how we get past that. This is how we beat that, right? How do we stop this? We don't. The machines will always win in the end. All we can do is evolve. It just wouldn't be a conference if we didn't have a Battlestar Galactica reference, right? Right. Do you know who this is? Not by name. Not by name. This is is the guy at work, or the gal at work, that stares out the window, and every time they stare out the window for long periods of time, all of a sudden they come up with an idea. All of a sudden they have a thought. They have a vision, they have a product, they have a whatever. And some of those turn out to be absolutely stupid. And some of them turn out to make the company a million dollars, at least. You can be him. You can be that person who stares out the window and thinks about stuff and comes up with the idea that all of a sudden everybody goes, oh my God, that's brilliant. And make the company a million dollars or make you a million dollars. Steve Jobs, routinely considered one of the brilliance of our industry, was actually something of an idiot. And I say that because if you go back and look at his most successful product launch, that is to say the iPod, that was phenomenally the dumbest thing that he could do. Think about it. Go back in time. Before the iPod launched, there were no other portable music players, right? There was nothing that you could hold in your hand that would actually play music based on software audio files, right? Hell no. There were dozens of them. The market was saturated with them. There were hundreds of MP4 players, we called them. There were all these. Everybody who had an electronics manufacturing line was making an MP4 player. You hook up some headphones, you download some music onto your device, make sure the formats were right, of course, and lo and behold, you have an MP4 player. And what Jobs realized was that people didn't want to rip and store and play their MP4s People wanted to play music. People didn't want to operate a computer. They wanted simply to use a device. Remember the original iPod? It had this really, really unique user interface thing that everybody struggled to copy and could never quite get. It was the click wheel. Because he understood that most of us tend to think of music in a circular fashion. We tend to think of dials. We tend to think of tuning the radio station we want to listen to. We tend to think of tuning which CD track we'd like to play or which CD we'd like to play next, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then married that up against iTunes so that now I didn't have to worry about ripping music off of my CD using one of a dozen different open source or, or, you know, commercial tools. I just literally put the CD in the drive and iTunes said, would you like to copy that music into your library? And you said yes, and it just worked. He was absolutely stupid in that he did exactly what every first-year business student will tell you not to do. Don't jump into a market that already has a series of established players. And he did it, and he was successful anyway. Does that mean he's brilliant? No. It means he was an iconoclast. An iconoclast is somebody that does something that other people say cannot be done. The term actually derives, it means officially the destroyer of icons. It derives from about, yeah, 1,300 years ago, not too far away from here. The emperor of the Byzantine Empire, Leo, was being christened emperor. Now, you got to understand that in the 700s A.D., The church was a very, very powerful force. 
The church actually was the one that christened the emperor. And as symbolism goes, this doesn't get any more frank. The church is the one bestowing the crown upon you. You kneel before the church, and the church gives you your crown. The implication, of course, being that if you don't play nice, the church can take it away again, right? That's what we do as parents. I give you this phone, but if you misuse it, I'll take it away from you. You go on a timeout. Leo would go on a crown timeout if he doesn't do what the church wants him to do. His throne is actually decorated with numerous church symbols, crosses and and so forth. And Leo said, fuck that. I'm not interested in being the church's puppet. So he literally climbed up onto the back of his throne and he started knocking all of those icons off, indicating that he was not going to be the church's puppet. It was one of the first conflicts between church and state in a, in a, at, at that level. There had been numerous for hundreds of years prior to that, but this is the first time that somebody at that level, the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, decided, I'm going to do this. He did a thing that everybody, conventional wisdom, said could not be done. You could not challenge the authority of the church that way. It was one of the first in a series of steps to slowly disentangle the church from state politics across Europe. And to a lot of people, that made the world a better place. There are a number of iconoclasts that we've seen across history. And there are a number of iconoclasts who did good things, which are most of the ones that we list up here. There are a number of iconoclasts who did a number of terrible things. And I would not suggest that you try to emulate them because the world already has one Donald Trump and we don't need another one. Thank you very much. We're gonna talk about a number of these folks and what they did and why they are iconoclastic. We, in our industry, have a number of iconoclasts as well. Alan Kay, for example, invented a whole number of things. He actually is the one who invented the laptop, the Dynabook, as it was called. He invented the mouse. He invented the graphical user interface. He invented Smalltalk. Much of what we do today would not have been possible had it not been for Alan Kay and all of the various things that he accomplished at the Xerox Palo Alto Research Center, PARC. Park Place, it was called. Linus Torvalds, of course, he's the one who actually published the source code to an operating system back at a time when everybody knew that operating systems had to cost hundreds of dollars per seat and were extraordinarily complicated things, which of course led to not only the initial open source movement, but also to the notion of publishing source code and Linux and so on and so forth. Dave Thomas, I actually speak here of Ruby Dave. Ruby Dave went out and talked about naked objects as a concept before he discovered Ruby and Rails, and now he's currently talking about Elixir. Dave has always sort of embraced this iconoclastic status by, you know, I don't want to do everything the way people have always done it before. I want to find the next new thing. In a time when everybody said that the publishing industry was tanking, nobody reads printed books anymore, Dave and his pragmatic programmer partner, Andy Hunt, created a new publishing company, the Pragmatic Press. And at a time when all these publishers were saying, oh, you have to use all these really, really complex templates in order to get the the material, the manuscript ready for camera, you know, in order to be sent to the printers, you've got to have these really complex word files. They actually set up a printing process that was a continuous integration process. You wrote in XML or some other format, You checked it into source control, and on the server side, they would actually take your files, format them, and send you back a PDF of what your book would look like if it were actually published. And everybody else in the publishing industry said, you can't do that. And Dave was at a publisher conference and said, we just did. We've had a number of iconoclasts inside of our industry who've done things that people said, there's there's no way. You just, you can't, you can't make that work. Your goal, if you want to avoid outsourcing, if you want to avoid being replaced by automation, 
by humans younger than you, by humans living in a different part of the world. Your job is to make yourself so valuable to the company that they cannot get rid of you. And the best way to do that is to be the iconoclast, to do those things that nobody else says can be done. So how do we do that? The iconoclast has three qualities. First of all, they see the world differently. They perceive something that nobody else is seeing. They have to overcome the fear that comes with that because there's a certain amount of biological drive that we'll talk about in a second that leads us to want to follow the herd. But the third thing is you have to be able to communicate this in a way that people will be able to pick up on it, understand it, and run with it. So going deeper into each one of those. I want you to look up for a second. You see those lights up there? And particularly that one over there or that one over there? It is a proven fact that you are the dimmest bulb in the room. Those lights literally produce more power than your brain does. The brain is a highly constrained device. It only produces about 40 watts of power. And actually, I should say it consumes. The body produces 40 watts of power. The brain consumes that to do all of the various things that it needs to do. Keep your heart beating, keep your lungs moving, how to move your muscles, how to do all of the voluntary and involuntary things that your body does on a daily basis. When to digest, all of that. 40 watts. I challenge anybody in this room to produce a computer anywhere near as sophisticated on 40 watts of power alone. And if you do take me up on this, one of the things you will very quickly figure out is it's actually a lot more approachable if we take shortcuts. If we figure out ways to, in fact, allow us to not have to do a full processing cycle, but if we can recognize a couple of things early on, then we don't have to actually uh, do the, the, the complete and we can save a couple of watts. For example, what do we see here? What? You see Pac-Man. You see three Pac-Men. How many of you see a gray triangle? Fair number of hands, right? How many of you see a white triangle? Fair number of hands, right? What if I were to tell you that this is none of those things, that I drew this shape entirely by hand? Because actually that's true. I drew this deliberately by hand, well, with a little help from MS Paint, because I'm actually pretty challenged as an artist. Those shapes aren't actually there. I just very carefully crafted the pixels to make you think that they're there. Optical illusion time, right? Why? Because the brain, as part of taking those shortcuts, is engaging in a limited form of what we call pattern recognition. The brain looks at, for example, those three angled white, greater than, less than signs, whatever you'd like to call them, those open-ended triangles, and says, you know what? If they're arranged in just such a way that that looks like that's a triangle. And yeah, it looks like we've got three black circles, and they're all of them hiding underneath this gray triangle. Which, by the way, again, does not exist. That's just a gray background. But your brain is convinced that it does because it sees it the gestalt, the overall picture, all of the various elements coming together, the way they line up, the way the angles are set up exactly correct, all of them coming together make it look like there's a gray triangle there and that there's actually a fully white triangle underneath and that there are three black dots underneath that because the brain operates in terms of pattern recognition, which means, by the way, that perception what we actually think we see is a matter of the brain, not the eyes. This is crucial. Your brain is doing all of those interpreting. The eyes are just relaying the visual signals to the brain that then says, this is what I believe I see. This is another classic optical illusion. Which of those horizontal lines is longer, the top one or the bottom one? Yeah, you guys have all seen this one before, right? We did this like in fifth grade. Can't fool us, dude. We're from Poland. 
American coming in here trying to convince us of stuff that isn't real? Why does it look like? Because, yeah, you're right. Those two are exactly the same length. I cut and pasted them just to make sure. But why does it look like the one on top is longer? Because perception is a matter of the brain. Very good. You remembered the last slide. In this contextual. In this particular case, what's happening is the brain is looking at the complete picture. Remember, it's a pattern recognition device. And in this case, it's looking at those two lines on the side there and saying, you know what? I've seen this before. I've seen this before. I have seen two lines that slope inwards towards one another when I stand in the middle of a railroad track and I stare off into the distance because perspective makes me believe that they are coming together, but I know after 40 some odd years on this planet, I know that those two are in fact parallel. Which means that if those two vertical lines are parallel, and you notice how the top one is actually closer to those two parallel lines, and the bottom one is not, the top one must be longer. It's just further off in the distance. Because here's the kicker. If we invert those vertical lines, is there any difficulty recognizing that those two horizontal lines are the same length now? Because we don't see this very often. The brain has to take an extra fraction of a second to process this picture before it says, you know what, I really have never seen this. I don't see buildings upside down like this. I stand at the base of a building, I see the slides sloping up like that, I don't see this reverse pyramid thing, unless you're in Orlando, Florida. There's actually a science discovery center where they built the building to look like it had been picked up and turned and put down on top, so the roof is on the bottom. It's the most bizarre thing you'll see. It's quite kitschy. It's quite uh, fun to walk in through the third story attic window. We don't see this. And so the brain's like, there's no pattern here. There's nothing for me to recognize. So yeah, clearly, those two horizontal lines are in fact exactly the same length. The most likely way that we will perceive something has everything to do with our history, has everything to do with what we're used to. The brain takes shortcuts. And it is, by definition, a learning device, right? First time you were a small child and you reached out and you touched something and it was hot, you were like, oh, shit, that hurt. I'm not going to do that again. So now anytime you walk up to the stove or anytime you walk up to the burner and you're getting ready to put your hand on the metal, you touch it very gently, very gingerly. You're never just going to reach in and grab it because you know from your experience that that could be hot and that could hurt and pain is a great teacher. What you perceive is a measure of your experience. So what happens when you see this picture? You see your project. <laughs> this, ladies and gentlemen, is the secret gem in the entirety of this talk. This is the universal architectural diagram. No matter what you are working on, no matter what kind of software project you are building, I guarantee you it can be described as box, arrow, box, arrow, cylinder. You are now all architects. See, this is what you get for sticking around through the very last session of GeekCon. You get a promotion. You can list it on your resume. And if another architect says, what makes you think you're an architect? You just get up to the whiteboard and you draw box, arrow, box, arrow, cylinder, and they'll be like, you know the secret handshake. <laughs> it's like the Knights Templar of software. Here's the funny thing, this, pro this, this secret goes back 60 years, 70 years. In the beginning, that was a dumb terminal talking to a mainframe, putting things into flat files. And then it was a client-side software running on like Windows, right? When we were talking about two-tier systems, right? So you'd have your, your uh, program here talking to a server, which would then store things in a database. Or this is your application talking to stored procedures that would store it in the database. Or this is a web browser talking to your web server, storing things into a database. Or this is a mobile app talking to an API, storing things into a database. 
It really is the universal architectural diagram. It works for everything. You guys know who this is? This is Chihuly. Might be easier if you look at this. Chihuly is one of the world's most famous glass workers, glass blowers to be more precise. If you've ever seen glass blowing, it's where they actually take a long rod, basically it's a metal straw, and you dip it into some melted glass, and then you blow in it, just a quick puff, and then you cap your thumb over it. Seattle actually has a large number of glass blowing shops in town because Chihuly comes from Seattle. And the bubble, the air that you've blown, goes into the glass, and so you help grow it, and then you shape it. You'll take it off of the rod, and you'll, you'll often shape it, or in some cases, we'll open it up so we can see the bubble inside. Chihuly is quite possibly the most successful artist financially in history, particularly if we don't take into account interest and relative uh, currency values. He's got a studio of about 100 some odd people. Uh, as a matter of fact, I think there are now several studios scattered all over the country doing various glass pieces. If you ever walk into uh, a hotel lobby and you look up and there's this really twisty glass piece, chances are good that that's either a Chihuly or it's one of his students. Um, he is one of the very few American artists to have had his own display, his own show at the Louvre. You guys know the French. The French hate everything American. The French willingly gave up space at the center of their culture, that is to say the Louvre, for an American to display his wares. That means he's got to be kind of some kind of a big deal. To buy a Chihuly piece, even the tiniest ones, $25,000 US. The big ones go for a million dollars. And all of this because he lost an eye. Remember, him. You'll notice that he's wearing a patch. This is not some sort of attempt to look like Nick Fury. Chihuly was out, actually, one day. Supposedly, he was surfing. And he um, got into an accident. I think Bored hit him in the eye or something. And it caused him to lose most of his vision in one eye. Now, one of the things about glass blowing you have to understand, before Chihuly, the goal of a successful glass blower was to produce a piece that was perfectly symmetrical, at least as much as the glass blower could get it to be. And quite frankly, if you lose one eye, you lose any sense of depth perception, which makes it really, really hard for you to actually produce something symmetrical, particularly when you can't just reach out and touch it. Because remember, this is hot glass. And if you touch it, you're going to burn yourself. And if the glass is cool enough that it doesn't burn your skin off, it'll be cool enough that it might actually like splinter and slice you. Two ways that the glass was trying to kill you. So, Chihuly said, well, shit, I've lost an eye. That's going to be difficult. And then, as the story goes, about a month later, he actually lost the use of his arm for a period of time. I think he like broke his arm or something. So now he's got one eye, one arm, and you can't do the glass blowing rod with just one arm. Those things are heavy, particularly when you put a, a gather of glass on the end of it. So Chihuly sits back and says, well, what do I do now? I don't want to give up glass blowing. This is my life. What do I do? I can't produce the symmetrical pieces that everybody expects me to do. So to hell with it. I'm not going to go for symmetrical because when you look at these pieces, clearly they're not symmetrical. Chihuly embraced the fact that I can't do that, so let me just go ahead and find the beauty in asymmetry. And because it was so different, because it was so new, everybody went absolutely nuts over it, still to this day. This kind of artwork is considered vastly prettier than the traditional glass blowing that we'd seen before, to the point where he's built a ridiculously good-sized nest egg, all because he lost an eye. You know who this is? This is Florence Nightingale. Absolutely right. She saved your life, whether you know it or not. See, Florence Nightingale was, of course, a nurse. She was one of the first to really incorporate what we consider modern nursing. 
And one of the things, of course, in the mid-1800s is that women were not doctors. Women were not doctors. It was a stupid rule, but it was the rule. Women could not be doctors because reasons. But Florence Nightingale was actually pretty perceptive. During the Crimean War, she was supporting the British soldiers, basically running the medicine tents and trying to get these soldiers to recover. And one of the things she noticed is that the soldiers who actually didn't go to the tents, had a tendency to survive more often. And more importantly, she noticed that doctors that were washing their hands actually tended to have a better patient recovery rate than those that didn't. She said, huh, that's kind of interesting. I wonder why that is. But you don't need necessarily to understand the causation as long as the correlation holds on a pretty regular basis, and it does. So she goes to Queen Victoria, because she first tries to go to the doctors and say, you know, you really should wash your hands. And the doctors are like, you're a woman. Go, go, go back to doing your womanly things. What do you know about medicine? And so Florence Nightingale says, you know what, I'm pretty sure I'm right about this. So she actually goes to Queen Victoria and says, Queen would you like to stop losing as many soldiers as you currently are? And the Queen Victoria, of course, because Queen Victoria was actually very, very involved in a lot of international affairs. This is the time frame when British is very actively managing their empire. And the Queen is very interested in not losing seasoned soldiers because who wouldn't? And so Florence Nightingale says, you're losing a lot of men to disease. And Queen Victoria says, meh, there will always be men that get lost to disease. Florence says, I don't think you really understand how many. So in what we believe is the very first use of a pie chart, she showed her. She literally came back with a, what we think is an easel, essentially, where she had painted a picture and said, look, this is the total number of men that are dying. This is the number of men who are dying on the battlefield. This is the number of men who are dying from dysentery because people aren't washing their hands. And Queen Victoria went, I get it now. And the queen promptly went to the army and said, all you medical people, surgeons and doctors and so forth, you will now start washing your hands, and those who don't will be shot. Now, granted, the queen is a woman, but she's the queen. And if she tells you you're going to be shot, you're probably going to be shot. So the doctors started washing their hands. And son of a gun, soldiers stopped dying which has led to a lot of the research into why that was. Pasteur then later discovered microbes and pasteurization and so forth, and which is why today it is medical malpractice for a doctor to operate on you in any sort of non-emergency scenario without having washed his hands, without having scrubbed up before the operation begins. The iconoclast sees things differently. The iconoclast, in some cases, has that different vision thrust upon them, like when Chihuly lost an eye. Or in some cases, because they happen to be observant, when Florence Nightingale noticed that some men were dying and some men weren't, and what was the commonality between those that were and those that weren't, etc. You need to be able to see the world differently. You need to be able to recognize what some of the current problems are and to be able to ruminate and examine and how would I look at this a little bit different. It would help to have a little bit of a philosophical background because that's what philosophers do all day is ask questions even if there are no immediate answers. But that's not enough. You can't just see the world differently because if you just see the world differently, you say, yeah, we should really be washing our hands. But then if you do nothing about it, people still die. You know who they are? This is the American country western band known as the Dixie Chicks. I want you to cast back in your memory a little bit. About 15 years ago, the United States was involved in this little brouhaha down in the Middle East. We had, in fact, invaded the sovereign nation of Iraq. And quite frankly, in the United States, it was a Wildly popular action because we had just been attacked a couple years earlier, 9-11. I think pretty much everybody knows that story. We were kind of, we, we were itching for some payback. And there were a lot of people in the United States who were very, very, very adamant about supporting the president in, in this 
time of war. One of the first things that everybody said is, you always support the president during war. Very commonly a uh, phrase that's uttered by whatever party is in power. In the year 2003, the Dixie Chicks were conducting a concert here in London, uh, not here in London, here in Europe, in London to be precise. During a break between one set and the next, the lead singer, Natalie Mines, stood up in front of the crowd at London and said, quote, we are ashamed the President of the United States is from Texas, which is where the Dixie Chicks themselves hailed. Now in London, that played very well because to be blunt, most of the rest of the world was not particularly thrilled with Bush the Younger's solo adventure in Iraq. He didn't even try really to put together a coalition. I think the Polish folk, I think you guys actually sent one battalion of support troops and I think the Germans gave us some money and that was pretty much it. The rest of it was all US. This played pretty well in London. She got a lot of cheers. She got a lot of enthusiasm. But when they got back to the United States, it was a completely different story. The Dixie Chicks received death threats. And I don't mean death threats like, I'm so pissed off I could kill you. I mean death threats like, you will be shot dead at your next show in Dallas. The kind of death threats that police actually take pretty seriously. She had to get around the clock uh, protection bodyguards for her and her family. As a matter of fact, there is one story where a radio station van, right, you know, those vans that will drive around to local places, you know, come on down here to the car wash, we're playing hits and getting your cars washed, and radio station van that had a picture of the Dixie Chicks on the side of the van was actually, while they're driving down the freeway at like 100 kilometers an hour, <clears throat> somebody pulls up next to them and points a shotgun at the van, screaming something incoherent about the Dixie Chicks and un-American and so forth. There are a lot of people in the United States, particularly Texans, who are very, very upset at the Dixie Chicks statement. Now, you fast forward a couple of years, and in the meantime, Maine's never recanted her statement. To this day, she will say, we, meaning the band, are ashamed that the President of the United States at the time, George Bush, was from Texas. During that time frame, the United States learned a number of things about our engagement in Iraq. First of all, that it was never, ever going to end. Second of all, that we went in on some rather flimsy pretext. And third of all, that war has this really annoying tendency to actually have dead bodies come home. We're, we were not particularly fond of what happened after that. We were not particularly fond of all of the, you know, the costs, the dead soldiers and so forth that have incurred. We were looking at the world in a very, very different way. The Dixie Chicks recorded another album. And although it never actually cracked the Billboard Top 40, this is actually a measure of how many times music is played on the radio. It was actually one of the number one's iTunes download bestsellers, meaning lots of people wanted to listen to this album. The general public had forgiven the Dixie Chicks, but radio stations had not because they were afraid. Because when you stand up and say, we're ashamed of the United States, we're ashamed of the president, we're ashamed of the military. That's everything that people were hearing when they made that statement. Radio stations didn't want to be caught in the crossfire. They were afraid. So was mines. That took a hell of a lot of courage, especially to never recant. Would have been very easy to say, oh, I got caught up in the heat of the moment, I'm sorry. And then stuff blows over and then they can go back to being a number one country and western best-selling band. Nope, she never recanted. Imagine for a moment that I decide to engage you in a small psychology problem. And the problem here is very, very simple. I want you to pull out a marble of a particular color, either white or black. Now, when I say a particular color, I mean, I say I want you to pull out a white marble, and you get to choose between either of these two urns, 
one of which has exactly 50-50, nine white marbles and nine black marbles in the left-hand urn here. The other one over here on the right, we don't know the mix. It could be 18 and zero, it could be 17 and one, it could be zero and 18. We don't know what's in that urn. And that's gonna stay consistent. We're not gonna swap out the marbles or anything like that. So the first time I ask you to pull out a white marble, which urn do you pick? If you're like most people who've done this particular psychology experiment, you pick that one, you pick the left one, where the known ratio lives. And I say, great, okay, cool. But now I want you to pick out a black marble. Which one do you pick? Most people will again go back to this urn over here, which is inherently inconsistent. You're actually an idiot. But it's okay because we're all idiots. Because this is known as the Ellsberg paradox. See, one of the interesting things about our brain is that we prefer the known to the unknown. We fear ambiguity. Here's the reason why you're an idiot, going back here for a second. If you think that this urn over here on the left has more black marbles than the one on the right, and you say, I believe that urn has more black marbles than the one on the right, so if I want to go for a black marble, I go for that one. But then in the very next phrase, I want you to pull out a white marble. Now you turn around and say, I believe that this urn has more white marbles than the other one. You're now making two logically inconsistent statements back to back. I believe this has more white marbles. I believe this has more black marbles. Assuming that has the same number of marbles, these two statements cannot be correct. And you have fallen victim to the Ellsberg paradox. Because the brain prefers the, 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 the non-ambiguous. It prefers the place where we believe we have more information. Your desire to pull from the known urn is because of ambiguity aversion. Your fear of the unknown. How many people recognize this craft? And answers of space shuttle are only partial right. You get, you get partial credit. What happens if I show you this picture? Some of you weren't born yet when this happened. Those of you with gray in your beard like me, you recognize this as the space shuttle Challenger, which exploded on takeoff roughly five or so minutes into liftoff into space. Challenger was one of those moments in American history that deeply scarred the nation. And we, of course, wanted to figure out what the hell happened. How did this happen? NASA has always been known as being this entity that was super, super careful. They have triple redundancy everything. How in the hell did this happen? There was no lightning strike. There was no missile strike. There was nothing. It just blew up on its own. How did this happen? We formed the Challenger investigation to try to research and figure out what happened. And Richard Feynman, one of the great physicists, basically found that, quote, the failure began with the faulty design of its joint. See, connecting the solid rocket boosters on the side to the central tank are some struts, and in particular, there are some welded spots where depending upon what temperature is, the metal expands or contracts. So you need to have something flexible to sort of grow or shrink with that. These were known as O-rings. The O-rings, however, were never designed to be used in sub-zero temperatures. Now, when we were launching the space shuttle out of Southern California, it very rarely drops below zero. Occasionally it does, and farmers scream about losing their orange tree crop. But most of the time it doesn't. Florida, on the other hand, occasionally drops below sub-zero. And sure enough, what had happened the, morning, the night before the Challenger launch, it had dropped below zero. The O-rings had frozen. And if you look at the Challenger footage, you can see from the right-hand rocket booster, there's flames shooting out seconds before the whole thing goes up. Because the O-ring was leaking, and the flames were coming out through the O-ring, because remember, that is just one big solid rocket propellant, 
And those flames were heating up that big center tank, which is, you guessed it, nothing more than more propellant, basically making the astronauts sit on top of one of the world's largest natural bombs. Eventually, the center tank gave way, the center propellant uh, ignited, and the rest is history. The faulty design of its joint and increased as both NASA and contractor management first failed to recognize it as a problem, then failed to fix it, and finally treated it as an acceptable flight risk. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to tell you that in your car, there is a mechanical defect that will cause your car to simply accelerate for no reason whatsoever and lock out the steering column and we are now going to sit around and describe how that's not really a failure and there's not really any fix for it and it's an acceptable driving risk. How many of you are on board with me? How many of you want to go driving in my car now? How did some of the most safety-minded individuals in the world come around to this? It's a problem known as groupthink. You get people into a room they sit down, they start discussing, and there are issues, there are agendas, there's all kinds of interesting things going on here, because what happened at NASA is a repeatable mistake, it's a repeatable problem. How many of you have ever played planning poker? Or gone around the room and got estimates on a, on a feature, on a story? If you've ever done this, then you've seen this at work, where there's five of you sitting around the table, and maybe you're using a Fibonacci series to estimate the story. You say, okay, guys, how many story points do we think this is going to take? All right, everybody on the count of three. One, two, three. Two, two, three, three, 13. What happens next? Everybody goes, what? And the person who did 13 is like, whoa, 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 whoa. maybe I was wrong. Maybe I was wrong. Let's, let's, let's vote again. Let's vote again. Because, because, yeah, if I'm thinking 13, I mean, clearly something's wrong with me, right? Because the herd knows best. When primitive man was scouring the wildlands looking for food, and primitive man saw everybody clustered around this water hole, and nobody was over at that water hole, you would think, oh, water hole, water hole, yeah, go get some water. But if nobody's over there, hmm, maybe there's something else going on there. Maybe there's a saber-toothed tiger hanging out in the trees waiting to drop on me and eat me. Maybe the water is actually poisoned. Maybe, who knows? But everybody's drinking from this water hole, and nothing bad seems to be happening to them, I'm going to go over to that water hole. Because the herd knows best. Because if I guess wrong, as primitive man, I die. Nobody wants to die. This, by the way, is again a very repeatable scenario. I bring you into a room. You've graciously decided to be part of an experiment that I am running. And I say, hey, Sorry, uh, everybody else got here a little bit before you. You're going to go sit in seat number 12 because there's 11 other people there, right? 12 is the size of a jury. So we're just going to ask basically some questions and so forth. And we show this picture. And the experimenter says, all right, I'd like you guys to take a very close look at this picture. Now, starting with juror number one, which of these lines on the right is the closest in length to the line on the left. And juror number one says A. Thank you. Juror number two, A. Juror number three, A. Juror number four, A. A, 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 A. Juror number 12. Statistically speaking, you'll say A. Now, looking at this, especially if you do the nee, 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 nee. Now I'm pretty sure it's B. Yeah, that's not the interesting part of the exercise. The interesting part of the exercise is when you ask juror number 12, because you may have already figured it out, the first 11 are plants. 
They're in on the joke. We're really testing you, juror number 12. And when you say A, why did you say that? And in some cases, the experimenters would say, oh, well, I said A because, you know, I thought maybe from where I was sitting, other people had a better look, or I thought maybe, you know, just based on the angles. But there were some people who said, no, definitively, it was A. They had convinced themselves that A was, in fact, the correct length. Because perception is a matter of the brain, not the eyes. Now, the fascinating thing about this is if any one person in that room dissents, juror number one, A, juror number two, A, juror number three, C, all it takes is one dissenter, even if they're wrong, and suddenly you now feel free to stand up and say B. The average guess of a group of individuals is better than any one individual's and often better than the best individual's guess. You've played this game, guess the number of marbles in a jar. When we actually collect all of our collective wisdom together, we get to what is usually about the right answer. It simply reinforces what we all have been wired back here in the lizard brain to understand. Follow the herd. The herd cannot be wrong. Nobody ever got fired for buying IBM. <laughs> and again, when you're out in the wilderness and you're trying to decide what water is safe to drink, when you watch the animals drinking, they probably know the safe water. And if they're not drinking from the water there, eh, maybe pass it, skip it, move on to the next. Fear is a thing. Fear is a really, really, really important thing wired into our biology. And so the best way for us to make decisions is absent any fear whatsoever, right? We should be methodical. We should be logical. We should absolutely embrace Mr. Spock and leave emotion completely out of it, right? Except we can't. Because it turns out that emotion is what actually makes the decision. As a matter of fact, when they've done MRI scans of human brains, when people are asked to you know, read an article and think about how this would relate, they've done this with respect to politics, for example. When you read an article, for example, about a shooting at a school, we can see that the decision-making centers of your brain fire first and then the logical processing parts of your brain fire. You literally make your decision and then look for data to support it. And in those people that actually have suffered physical trauma to the brain such that they do not feel emotion anymore, psychologists have reported that it's absolutely impossible for these people to do anything, to make any kind of decision. Even just what time would you like the appointment next week? They gauge in all kinds of analysis. Well, if I do it at this time, then I have to think about this. But if I do it at this other time, then I have to think about how, that, how I'm going to get from A to B. They get into an analysis paralysis. It literally requires emotion to make that decision. We can't just leave emotion at the door. We need it in order to make those decisions. This is the most important thing about this. The iconoclast feels that fear. They know damn well what they're doing. When I stand up here and tell you microservices are absolutely overvalued and it's really just another way to think about componentizing your code and everything else is window dressing by vendors trying to sell you a fast buck, there's a lot of you are going to be like, now wait a second. I just gave a talk on microservices and let me tell you, Ted, fuck you. Because, yeah, there's a certain amount of fear in me standing up here and saying that stuff, particularly if I'm not sure I can actually defend that point. I can, but that's a different discussion. The iconoclast feels that fear, knows it for what it is, and says, I'm just going to charge for it anyway. One who fears the future, who fears failure, limits his, his or her activities. Failure is only the opportunity to more intelligently begin again. There is no disgrace in honest failure. None. 
But you have to believe that deep down. You know who this is? No, that's not me. This is David Hannemeyer Hansen, DHH. This is a guy who created Ruby on Rails. Ruby on Rails was, again, iconoclastic. Back in the day when we were all doing Java and we were wrestling with all these different XML deployment descriptors and whatnot, Ruby on Rails was a huge breath of fresh air because it was this whole notion of convention over configuration. It was this whole notion of creating these types, creating this, this uh, build tool rake using this programming language that didn't require a, an adherence to static typing. This was really, really big deal. This was good stuff. And DHH has, in fact, been really lambasted, raked over the coals, criticized, ostracized, and ridiculed, not for rails, but because he stood up at a conference, at a Rails conference, RailsConf 3, if I'm not mistaken. And the slide before this was, we understand that here's a list of all these features that all of you in the Rails community have asked that we add to Rails. And my response is, that slide. My response is, we know better than you. So you will shut up, sit down, and love whatever we give you. You know who this is? Edwin Armstrong. Among other things he invented, he invented FM radio. He discovered that the FM radio band was actually quite superior to AM radio, which was the technical superiority of the time. And he was so excited about his invention that he went to his best friend, David Sarnoff, who was in fact an executive vice president at RCA. I'm sorry, he was president of RCA. And he said, David, 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 check this out. This is so much better than what you've got now. And Sarnoff looked out, figuratively and literally, at the virtual forest of AM radio towers that they had just installed on buildings all across New York and realized that to actually follow up on Edwin's invention meant ripping out and or replacing all of those towers. And David said, ah, no way, can't do it. So not only did he refuse to follow the technologically superior, he actually set his engineers out to disprove FM. And Armstrong actually set up several experiments to prove that FM was better. Matter of fact, during the middle of a thunderstorm, he set up an FM tower on the top of this, um, I forget what it was, the tallest building in New York at the time, and clearly broadcast to anybody who wanted to listen, where AM, of course, was filled with static from the electrical storm of the lightning. And then they said, no, you can't have your tower up here. So the next time he did it, he did it from a building out in Jersey, 50, 60, 70 miles away, and it was still clearer than the AM band. And eventually, RCA relented and put up FM towers, but not until after he was dead. This guy had invented FM radio, couldn't get anybody to buy into it, died penniless and alone in a Chicago apartment. This is what happens to the iconoclast sometimes. This is the fate of the iconoclast who cannot communicate their idea, who cannot get them across who cannot get other people to buy into the idea, to see it for what it's worth, and to share a little bit of that fear along with it. It's really easy as a software engineer to say, you know what, I believe that Elixir is like the best thing ever. Ah, this is such a cool technology. Great, I'm gonna put you in charge of our next mission critical project, and not only will you be fired if this fails, but so will your entire team. You still ready to bet on Elixir? You ready to bet your career as well as those of your teammates? Because you know they're going to be a little pissed at you if you're wrong. How do you communicate this? How do you get this across? This is social intelligence. This is how we actually get people to buy into what we are selling. Now, you could, of course, just wait 
You can just kind of hang back and see whether or not this thing becomes mainstream. Which means at that point, you're not really an iconoclast. You're just, you know, maybe somebody who had a better eye for detail than the rest of us. And none of the rewards will come with it. Do you know who these guys are? These are two of the greatest painters known to man. Pablo Picasso, before Chihuly, probably the most successful artist in history. In 1973, his estate was worth $750 million. That's real money, not Donald Trump money. He produced 13,000 paintings, 300 sculptures, widely respected, loved, actually had many lovers of both sexes, as uh, the rumors say. Matter of fact, Picasso was willing to paint at any given moment in time. There's a great photo of Picasso is holding up a china plate, and he's got a marker in hand, and he's sketching a picture of Groucho Marx. This is at a president's dinner. He's actually drawing a picture of one of the Marx brothers on a seal of the United, President of the United States plate, sketched it out. That plate fetches like $50,000 today. Picasso was willing to draw anybody at any given time. Van Gogh did 900 paintings, died penniless and alone. Van Gogh also supposedly cut off part of his ear and sent it to a woman that he wanted to be his girlfriend. Yeah, Van Gogh's not exactly a role model. The key difference between those two is that Picasso understood that if you want to be respected, if you want to be understood, if you want to be adored and loved, you have to communicate with the people. The people are important. Van Gogh, Van Gogh was like, oh, no, I just want to paint. I just want to be eccentric. I just want to be off in the world of my own, cutting off body parts and sending them to random people. Picasso, $750 million. Van Gogh, $0. The iconoclast understands that social intelligence has to do with two things, familiarity and reputation. How easily can I recognize you? And once I do, what do I know about you without ever having met you? How many of you know who that is? That's Professor Snape. That's Hans Grubel. It's Alan Rickman, who up until the Professor Snape, no, Snape role was one of the great that guy of Hollywood. See, there are a number of actors and actresses that you've seen in dozens of movies, and you have no idea who they are. Their faces are so familiar, but you have no idea who they are. It's like, yeah, 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 yeah. You, um, uh, you know, that guy, the guy who was in Ant-Man, the, uh, the guy who was in that other movie with the three dads, the, the, that guy. It's familiar, and that's part of the reason why Hollywood keeps casting the same people over and over and over again, because they want the familiar. I challenge you to go watch any action movie of the last 15 years and find me a villain without a goatee. Everybody knows that bad guys always have a goatee and are bald. We like the familiar. In the United States, for the longest time, up until at least the early 90s, the bad guy was always Russian. And he would always talk like this, which was actually more like German and Russian combined. Where are your papers? We're a very simple people over in America. We like our bad guys to wear black hats and our good guys to wear white hats, and yeah, we're done. The brain likes the familiar. Because the familiar is easy to process. It's a shortcut. We can tap into that. Reputation is the other half of this. I am familiar to a lot of people who go to conferences in the Java scene. I'm familiar to a lot of people who go to conferences in the .NET scene. But I wouldn't keep coming back unless a lot of people somehow thought that I was pretty good at what I do. Now, you personally may have a different opinion difference of opinion. You may think I'm terrible. My God, this guy just keeps going on and on and on. Do you know who this is? Do you know who this is? The hell. 
I could do that. That's the whole reputation thing. Venkat Subramaniam. Venkat is one of the most loved figures in the entire Java space. Why? Because he's actually pretty good at what he does. And dude just does not know how to not get on a plane. People ask me, hey, where does Venkat live? And I said, he lives out of a suitcase. He pays taxes in Denver, Colorado. But he lives out of a suitcase because he will go anywhere in the world to stand up, well, stand as high as he gets anyway, and talk to you about anything in the Java world that you'd like to know, or the Agile world, or even the .NET world, or the JavaScript world, because Venkat like, likes everything. This is a case where Venkat has both familiarity as well as reputation. There are a number of speakers who have reputation but no familiarity, and there are a number of speakers who have familiarity but no reputation, or it's a bad one. If you're going to be an iconoclast, you need to challenge both of these. And one of the interesting things about the social intelligence is it doesn't necessarily mean it has to be in person. You don't have to go out to a conference and stand up in front of a room. It helps because then you become more familiar and then people can identify more closely with you and what you're doing and who you are, etc. But you can also do this a lot through open source. If you want to commit to a series of projects, if you become a core committer, people get to know who you are and they can judge your work based on how well you've committed, what kind of pull requests you've created, et cetera. This works in many cases on a microcosm within that open source project itself. Familiarity, you maybe send a couple of comments, ask for some bugs, reputation, you've submitted some pull requests that actually adhere to the coding standards and actually have tests. And after you do this a couple of times, the core committer group says, hey, should we, should we let Teresa in? Should we let her like, be a core committer on this project? All in favor, plus one. Yep, now she's a core committer. Familiarity and reputation do not have to exist purely at the social level. They can exist online without ever having to set foot outside of your house. This combination of familiarity and reputation is how you connect with people. Familiarity, you know me. You understand that I have something to say. Reputation, you've said a lot of smart things in the past. All right, I will sit here and listen to you now. That doesn't come overnight. You have to work at it. The iconoclast is one who understands all three of these. You see the world differently. You actively engage in ways to perceive it differently. If you're a developer right now who's only ever looked in Java, Maybe it's time to pick up a new programming language. And I don't mean go and learn C Sharp because, frankly, that's just the same thing as Java. It's just one has an Oracle logo and the other has a Microsoft logo. There are some differences. But if you really want to change the way you look at the world, try Haskell or try Smalltalk or try Inform7. I won't tell you what it is, but you'll be pleasantly surprised when you discover it. You need to see the world differently. You need to understand that you're going to ostracize yourself a little bit for doing so. There are going to be people who don't understand what you're doing. Ladies and gentlemen, I love programming languages. There is no programming language in the world that I'm not interested in studying except Perl. Because <laughs> Perl is an abomination before God and mankind. And I can say that because I've studied a whole bunch of them. And I'm okay with that. There are Perl people who hate me, throw darts at my photograph. I don't care. If I ever run into them in person, I might have to, you know, run the other way. But from here, you want to become an iconoclast. You want to look at the world differently. You want to embrace the fear that comes with it. And you want to figure out how to communicate that to other people using your familiarity and your reputation. If you want to convince your vice president that Elixir is the best thing that you should use going forward, then you have to build the familiarity and the reputation to make that stick. And if you do that, they will never fire you. Now it is time for you to follow the lead of these two folks and get the hell out of here. See ya. <laughs>